Good morning. You listen to FloorDaily.net, and I'm Kemp Parr. This morning, my guest is Frank Andrini, who is a CARE board advisor. Most people know CARE as the Carpet America Recovery Effort. Frank, how you doing? I'm well, Kemp. How are you today? I'm good. We were together last week in New Orleans, and you gave a presentation around the viable outlets for spent PET carpet. I wanted to do a quick interview on that. A little background on you, Frank. You worked for Mohawk for many years And while you were with Mohawk, you served on the CARE board. Now that you're an independent consultant, you still serve a function as a board advisor on this PET topic, right? Yes, I serve as a board advisor on all topics relating to to the CARE board. But specifically, I've been tasked with the responsibility of trying to find an answer to recycling post-consumer PET carpets. All right, so let's set the stage for our listeners. Most people know that in the residential market, PET carpet has passed nylon now as the leading construction type, right? Yes, I believe it has. just happened recently. So the problem is CARE has, over the 13 years of its existence, created these sorter collector network that collects spent carpet. And the problem with PET carpet is, is is there's no economic viable outlet, and it's choking this system of reclamation, right? Yes, Kim, that that is correct. The entire collection and processing recycling infrastructure that's been developed with the health of care over the past, say, 10, 12 years has all been uh, directed toward nylon because nylon was a ready market for material that didn't have to be perfectly clean. It could have some polypropylene. It could have some calcium carbonate. And nylon is a is a large resin for engineered plastics. So nylon is what the entire recycling infrastructure was was based on. And so now that PET is past nylon in residential carpet, it's clogged the system up. And you've been tasked to try to find economically feasible outlets for PET carpet. You gave a presentation, and I thought we'd go through some of that. Obviously, one of the outlets that is somewhat controversial is waste to energy. Talk about the pluses and minuses of that, if you would. I know typically waste to energy is not considered in the U.S. as recycling, but the creation of energy is very important. If you were to create energy with uh, virgin materials, it would be more harmful to greenhouse gas emissions and it would take a lot more effort. We're not saying that waste to energy is the prime method of recycling that we want to attack, but it has to be part of the answer because there's some waste material that absolutely can't be cleaned up economically, and part of the answer is waste to energy. For example, pyrolysis has been around a long time, or degrading the polymer back into its oil components and making fuel, either diesel or gasoline or some sort of fuel. Uh, it could be, uh, could be electricity, it could be steam. And so that's got to be part of the answer because not all materials can be recycled properly as a new product. I was enlightened during this meeting to hear that when you burn PET carpet, you know, most people who follow this know that coal puts out a lot of carbon emissions and it's not a great energy source, whereas natural gas is a much cleaner burning fuel source and PET is actually closer to natural gas. So therefore, of all the options out there for creating energy, is one of the cleaner sources, right? Yes, it is, and it has a lot of BTUs. Part of the BTU chain is the polypropylene, which converts very, very well. It has a lot of BTUs. So when you when you mix the PET with the, uh, with the back end, which is made of polypropylene, it creates a very clean source of of energy and fuel, just as virtually any carpet does. Now, the other items that were on your list as a potential source for sending this recycled carpet, Ron Greitzer's operation in California where they make carpet pad, that's one item that takes a lot of tonnage. But you also talked about a composite board that you thought the potential for that was potentially 100 million pounds. So that's an option as well, right? Yes, it is. The recycling outlets can be divided into the sort of two buckets. One would be what I call the, the fiber bucket, where fiber of some type, PT fiber of some type is used. And the other bucket is the pellet bucket, where it goes into other applications. But on the fiber side, there is one company that is using polyethylene right now as their prime material for plastic lumber, decking and, and railing and those types of materials. And they've been looking at PET for a number of years. They have held back a little bit on their plans in terms of timing because they wanted to develop a product that was what the marketplace needed. But that plant, or several plants, could take from 30 
$50 million to $100 million pounds of PET just from one company alone. There are other applications of fibers, such as, as you mentioned, Ron Greitzer's fiber pad and other fiber pads. But in general, the fiber category can be put into all sorts of batting of fill compounds, shoddies, sound attenuation products. But those are few and far between, and the economics of that are very, very tight. So the, the production of the PET material has to be very low cost to fit into those categories. All right, so as you look at this overall landscape of all the options for an economical solution, which one offers the best opportunity? Well, I think it's a combination. I think Western Energy is part of it, the fiber side is part of it, the pellet side is part of it. We have so many hundreds of millions of pounds that not one solution will take it all. I think the largest opportunity in terms of economics as well as volume being generated is what I call on the pellet side. Part of the present recycling infrastructure that was developed for nylon can also be used to process PT carpet. The PT carpet fibers for the pellet side have to be taken to a new level of cleanliness and a new level of polymer purity because there is no engineered resin market for PT as is available for nylon. So the PT pellets not only have to be literally have no calcium carbonate and no polypropylene contamination, but the polymer has to be enhanced by solid stating the polymer after extrusion. Then that material is potentially ready for packaging, for sheets, for film, thermoforming, all of those black packages that you see, for example, in, in food applications where you may buy a thermal product like a sandwich and it's got a black bottom and a clear top. Well, that packaging is typically PET packaging, food trays, for example. All right. So what are the next steps to try to get pure recycled PET for that application? Well, Kev, the next steps are we, we've generated uh, pure PET with present recycling infrastructure from the collectors and processors, and the next step is actually creating material with an enhanced uh, intrinsic viscosity, or IV as we call it, so that the polymer is reconstituted to its original polymer structure. Then we have several companies lined up ready to sample the product, see how it fits into their present PT product portfolio. Who are you working with to create that level of pellet? There is a company located in, in Italy that has a one-step solid-state process. By one step, I mean from extrusion all the way to solid-stating. And the solid-stating one-step system is very, very cost-efficient so that IV-enhanced material is not too expensive, so it fits into the present economic structure of those companies' uh, PT products. This company in Italy, would they build a plan here in the United States? It actually is literally a piece of equipment. Uh, anyone can purchase it or buy it. In fact, one company that I've uh, developed a relationship with has agreed to buy one of these lines and put it in if we find outlets for those materials. So literally anyone that has the capability of extruding or knows how to extrude can purchase one of these units and actually begin enhancing the material and sell it to these outlets. But I've got to find the companies and, and work with the companies to develop the samples and materials so they can put it into their products and say, yes, it works. No, it doesn't work. It works, but you got to do some additional sampling. So we're at that stage today. So there is an optimistic perspective on this that eventually, through your help, we'll be able to find outlets for this PET fiber. Yes, there's no shortage of outlets. The largest concern that I have is that today, people who use recycled PET materials compare their economic models against bottle flake because most people are using bottle flake as their recycled PET material. Mm -hmm. So we can't be any more expensive than bottle flake because they have bottle flake as an alternate material to go to. So we've got to be no more and preferably less than the cost of bottle flake uh, with the same performance characteristics. Do you think that's an achievable goal? It is achievable. From the models that I put together, it is achievable. Under today's commodity prices, it's a little tougher, mm -hmm. but all commodities are affected by the price of oil today. Okay, Frank. Well, it's good to catch up with you. I definitely want to shine the light on what you're doing as the CARE Board Advisor focused on this PET issue. Again, we've been talking to Frank Andrini, and you've been listening to Kemp Har and Floridelli.net.